This seemingly normal axe is quite a historic piece. It was used to climb one of the highest mountains in North America, Denali. This ice axe was made in 1913 for a famous mountain climber, Harry Carstens. Harry was the guide and climbing leader of the first complete ascent of Denali in 1913. The axe is quite rare and is only one of three axes that made it back. Robert Tatum lost his in the McKinley River when he fell backwards with a heavy pack. Walter picked him up and carried him out. Harpers and Stucks disappeared. It is pertinent to note that Harry wasn't the only one in the expedition. But there were two others, right? Yes, Robert Tatum and Walter Harper. And Walter Harper was an Alaska native. He was. Did they all have ice axe? They did. The axe is particularly prized among collectors because it was used in a significant event. At an auction, this axe would retail at the price of. At retail, for insurance purposes, $20,000. Oh, <laughs> oh no. it's a little bit too much. <laughs> From a humble auction find to a globe-trotting family heirloom, this oak masterpiece embodies the spirit of American craftsmanship. This Stickley Brothers Tabaret, purchased by this guest's father, has traversed continents and generations. Stickley Brothers, part of the quaint furniture line, this piece exemplifies the arts and crafts movement dedication to form and function. Crafted from a quarter-sawn white oak, its tiger-like grain pattern adds a touch of natural artistry. But when you cut it on an angle, it gives you like a tiger pattern. The unique model number, 314 and a half, speaks to the whimsical nature of its creators. With its exposed joinery and thick top, this tablet embodies the arts and crafts philosophy of honest craftsmanship. Despite some wear, its practicality and design continue to captivate collectors. Aspect to the way this is made, Arts and crafts collectors are very keen on originality and finish. Originally intended as a plant or lampstand, this versatile piece has found various uses throughout its long life. This well-traveled piece of American furniture history at auction is now valued at. In this original condition at auction, this would bring about $800. Not what I would have expected. <laughs> In Chinese culture, jade is more than just a stone. It's a symbol of purity, mobility, and immortality. The guest purchased this piece in a junk shop in a small village near the Great Wall of China in 1988. I had a drawer full of just rusty items and like marbles, and I happened to see that in there and I asked how much it was. This particular item is a 15th century jade carving, making it well over 600 years old. It was created as part of a belt worn for both ornamental and ceremonial purposes. On the surface of the piece, we can see intricate layered carvings. Additionally, it features three layers, representing lotus leaves, plants, and scroll work. However, we can discern a worn corner, a testament to the passage of time. I actually looked around in the drawer for the missing broken piece. It was nowhere to be found. Despite its slight damage, this item, a symbol of ancient Chinese craftsmanship, would fetch a significant price at auction. A reasonable value is $1,500. Wonderful. <laughs> Given the condition, I, I think that's a very good price. If it were fully intact, could be about $3,000. All right, well, thank you very much. Within these pages lies not just a story, but a piece of literary history penned by the hand of America's greatest humorist. This 1902 edition of Mark Twain's The Innocents Abroad transforms from ordinary to extraordinary with a single inscription. Though not a first edition, the book's value soars with Mark Twain's personal touch, a lengthy inscription and signature from 1906. Thinking it was a first edition, I went to check it out. In fact, it's not. It was published in 1902. Twain's wit shined through his aphorism. It is better to be a young June bug than an old bird of paradise. In this case, he says, consider well the proportions of things. It is better to be a young June bug than an old bird of paradise. The mysterious dedication for Rachel and an unknown bookplate add layers of intrigue to this literary artifact passed down through generations. This book carries not just Twain's words, but a family history. And in this case, it wasn't the first edition. However, the inscription with the aphorism. While the book's edition may not be rare, Twain's personalized inscription elevates its significance immensely. This unique blend of literature and personal history from one of America's most beloved authors is valued at. 
at three to four thousand dollars. That's kind of what it, my dad and I were thinking. Oh, you guys have thought that already? We just guessed. If it was a first edition, I would probably be at five to seven thousand dollars. So the edition is important in the value, but it's not the overriding value of the book. I think my dad will like that. In the spectrum of love, some diamonds whisper while others sing. This fancy yellow gem is a sonnet in stone. This engagement ring, chosen 35 years ago, holds not just a promise of love, but a rare treasure of nature. Selected in New York from an elderly gentleman's collection, this 3.4 carat diamond captivated with its unusual hue. Its color, once described as intense and fancy, hints at its extraordinary nature in the world of gemstones. It's a really beautiful color. I mean, the, the yellow color is really impressive. The Gemological Institute's certificate from the 1970s may understate its current grading due to evolving standards. In the hierarchy of yellow diamonds, this stone sits near the pinnacle, potentially graded as fancy intense or even fancy vivid. Its modern, round, brilliant cut enhances the stone's natural fire and brilliance. And the clarity of the stone is very nice. Okay. The cut of the stone is a modern, round, brilliant cut. This rare yellow diamond, a testament to both love and nature's artistry, is valued at. Easily see this selling for about $140,000 to $160,000. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. I just can't even believe that. It's a really beautiful stone. Step into a world where pigment and parchment weave tales of ancient Persia where each brushstroke is a whisper from centuries past. These exquisite miniature paintings, handed down through generations, are not mere artworks, but portals to bygone eras. Two pieces originating from Shiraz in Persia date back to the late 16th or early 17th century, illustrating stories from the Kamsa of Nizami, Shiraz Iran. Crafted with mineral pigments and gold on paper, these masterpieces bring life to cultural heroes from Sasanian Persia. Their lives. These things are done on paper with mineral pigments and gold, magnificently painted, really beautiful works. The third piece, a Mughal painting from 17th century Rajasthan, showcases a completely different style. Its reverse side reveals intricate calligraphy on two sides, adorned with borders of powdered lapis lazuli. These treasures, once purchased from the noted New York dealer Can Monif, now hold significant value. The Shiraz pair is estimated to be worth would probably sell for between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars. While the Mughal piece alone could fetch, would probably sell for about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars alone. Wow! Archives from the Klondike Gold Rush are like time capsules, preserving the tales of countless adventures. Klondike Gold Rush. On display is an archive from the Klondike Gold Rush set before us. These items originally belonged to the guest's great-grandfather's brother, who was a part of the Klondike Gold Rush Stampede, Klondike Region. Included in the collection is a map used by the guest's ancestor during his quest for gold. Came across here the, the Yukon River, which would take him well, well into Alaska, into this Klondike Region, which is where the gold had been discovered. We also have his personal diary, which contains details of his day-to-day -day activities, it was dated Friday, November 25th, 1898. Clear, windy day. Stayed in cabin all day resting. Had a severe attack of piles and am very sore all over from our walk. Another item is a photograph showing the camp in the Klondike region. Although the guest's great uncle spent about two years in the Klondike region, he unfortunately did not manage to find any gold. The Klondike gold rush left a lasting impact on North American culture and economy. Considering the historical significance of these items, we can expect them to fetch an auction value of. Some of that we would estimate in the three to five thousand dollar range. Okay. This painting is one of the most iconic ever created. It is called The Illustrious Guest, and it represents US Senator Henry Clay. The painting was created by the famous artist James Henry Beard. James Henry is regarded as one of the best portrait artists, and this painting confirms that. This painting is significant because Henry Clay was an important political figure. Senator from Kentucky and was probably the most recognizable politician of the 19th century next to uh, Abraham Lincoln. He ran for president several times and, and lost. In this picture, however, he's depicted sitting in a tavern as a common man, which intrigued many people. The detail in the painting demonstrates the skill of a master painter. And there's a lot of curious gawkers. They know we have a famous guy here, so we start seeing things like they're checking out his 
Kane to see what the initials are. And then there's something clever that Beard did. At a suitable auction, this painting would retail for. Auction estimate on this of three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. Oh my gosh, really? We have two vintage toy vehicles that were inherited from the guest from her father in 1980. I know there's at least a steamroller in this set, and I know there's one other toy. I, I'm just not positive which But these one are the is. ones you ended up these with. These are the ones I, I... One of the toys is a model fire truck, and the other is a model bus. They were crafted from steel by the Buddy L Company around the 1920s. Buddy L Company. These toys are extremely durable, unlike conventional toys, they cannot be easily broken through play. However, due to their steel construction, they are quite heavy and have been mostly left to rust where they were played with. Despite this, the fire truck model still has its original decals and is functional. In this condition, it would be valued at. In this condition, around an eight to $1,200. On the other hand, the bus model, being rarer, also retains its original decals and maker's mark. Its estimated worth is. This one is a little below average. Probably in the three to four thousand dollar range. I'm I'm astounded. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Exhibited in the show is a collection of comic art from the World War II period. These pieces were created by the guest's great uncle, who served as a World War II cartoonist. This guest's great uncle enlisted in the army in 1942 and unfortunately died in the line of duty in 1945. He was a PFC, but he ended up with General Patton's Third Army. So throughout the war, I mean, he's incredibly talented. They're really well developed for a young kid. Included in the collection is a photograph of the guest's great uncle. This collection of comic art is aesthetically pleasing, featuring strong cartoon narratives. One piece in the collection depicts a young soldier bragging to a village child in France about how they scared away the Nazis. Interestingly, many of these artworks were actually published during the War Stars and Stripes magazine. This collection of art from the World War II period captures the light-hearted side of a tragic era and is estimated to be worth. Etc. would price sell between $2,000 and $3,000. Behold, a seat that defies convention, where whimsy meets mid-century design in a swirl of plywood and imagination. This wacky chair, a flea market find, is more than furniture. It's a piece of design history. Designed by George Malhauser for Plycraft in 1965, this chair represents the pinnacle of mid-century modern creativity. George Malhauser. Its nautilus-like arms and bent plywood construction showcase the innovative spirit of 1960s furniture design. When you look at it, definitely combines several things. I love these arms. They remind me sort of of, of a nautilus or ram's horns, which is interesting and sort of rare. Originally part of a patio or dining set, this chair often accompanied a uniquely designed table. It was also part of a patio set because it's a very short chair or part of a small dining set. Mulhauser also credited with designing George Nelson's iconic coconut chair, brings his signature style to this piece. George Nelson, purchased for a measly sum. This chair's value has skyrocketed in the collector's market. I bought it maybe two years ago, and I think I paid $250 for it. Today, this singular piece of mid-century modern art is valued at. At auction, $1,500 to $2,500. In the folds of this document lies the weight of history, where tragedy meets remorse in a delicate dance of words. You brought a document relating to the tragedy of May 1970, the shooting of students by National Guardsmen at Kent State. This typed agreement, born from a judge's royal typewriter, brought closure to one of America's darkest moments, the Kent State shootings. Beyond the settlement amount, this document carries the power of an apology for the events of May 4th, 1970. And the settlement was for $675,000. It acknowledges the fear and anxiety of the guardsmen while deeply regretting the tragic loss of life. Signed by Governor Rhodes, Adjutant General Del Corso, and the National Guardsmen involved, it stands as a testament to reconciliation. James A. Rhodes, Major General Sylvester T. Del Corso. This document crafted to assuage the tragic memories, bridges the gap between legal settlement and emotional closure. While the monetary compensation seems modest in hindsight, the apology's significance cannot be overstated. This poignant piece of recent American history at insurance value is valued at. Insurance, a value of 10 to 15,000 would not be too much. Thank you very much. 
It's not unusual to see automobile posters, but these are the cream of the crop. These posters are the automobile posters used in 1905 in Boston. Although many of the posters are slightly damaged, they are still in good condition. Old 1903, there was one with the year of 1908, and uh, hand penciled 1907. They are all original pieces, and they are not paper, which is what most people would think. In fact, they're stone lithograph posters. These posters were designed by expert graphic designers. To many automobile memorabilia collectors, this would be a great collection to add. For this reason, these posters would fetch the auction price of between $5,200 and $7,800. Great, great, absolutely. In a symphony of watercolor, Lionel Feininger orchestrates a visual melody where reality dances with fantasy. Lionel Feininger, this inherited treasure, titled Silbernstern or Silver Stars, captures the essence of Feininger's unique style. Created on February 10, 1921, this watercolor reduces celestial bodies to simple geometric forms. Well, the picture is signed down here, lower left, as we can clearly see, and it's also dated, this translates to Thursday, the 10th day of February, 1921. Feininger, born to musician parents in New York, chose art over music, studying in Paris and Germany. New York, his involvement with the influential Bauhaus School in 1919 solidified his place in the modernist art world. The artist's ability to blend realism with fantasy is evident in the vibrant colors and simplified shapes of this work. He manages to make his works a little bit of realism but a lot of fantasy and they're just very, very appealing. An original watercolor work, it holds significant artistic and monetary value. This exquisite piece of modernist art is estimated to be worth if this were offered in a retail gallery, it might sell for as much as $75,000. You must be kidding. No. Oh my God. This mug looks like your typical cup used for drinking coffee, but it's more than that. What we have here is a shaving cup. These cups were popular during the early part of the 20th century and came in different varieties. Okay, there's all kinds. There's decorative, there's ones from fraternities, there's advertising, yeah. there's glass. It's important to note that of all the varieties, this type is the most sought after. This cup was likely manufactured in 1910, and it contains a picture of men working in the Panama Canal. Shaving cups were used to store shaving lather without getting your hands soapy. This particular one is made from highly fragile ceramic, but is still in good condition. This is a truly iconic shaving mug and at auction, it would sell for. Have an estimate of $3,000 to $5,000. Oh, that shocks me. <laughs> Thank you, man. The guest bought this fine looking marvelous sculpture from an antique store for $500. This was a sculpture of Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the great American philosophers of the 19th century. The maker of this marvelous piece was a prominent American sculptor, Daniel Chester French. Daniel Chester French also did the Lincoln statue in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., which was probably his most famous work. The workpiece that got his career going was the sculpture of the Minuteman in Concord, Massachusetts. This piece, dated 1879, was signed Daniel Chester French on the side. It was also signed on the underside with the name of the foundry from Chicago. This piece was well cast and beautifully modeled, and the finish and the patination were quite good. Despite some minor condition issues that had negligible impact on its value, the appraiser estimated the price of this piece to be. A piece like this at auction, I think conservatively would bring in the fifteen dollars to $25,000 range. Wow. Presented with a vintage trunk from 1925, the guest who brought it onto the show inherited it from her father. This particular trunk was made by the Louis Vuitton company. Unlike the rounded top trunks of its time, this Louis Vuitton trunk features a flat top. It's adorned with the classic LV monogram canvas, making it both aesthetically pleasing and durable. We can see some old travel stickers on the body of the trunk, suggesting it was used for many journeys. Additionally, the trunk is equipped with a high-quality brass lock as a vintage Louis Vuitton item. One can only imagine how much this piece would fetch at an auction. Persian artisans have long been celebrated for their exquisite jewelry making skills. An example is a bracket that was brought onto the show by this guest, who purchased it in a shop 10 years ago. Do you remember what you paid for it? Not exactly, but probably $900 to $1,000, somewhere in that. 
At first glance at the item, one can't but notice the vibrant Persian turquoise adorning the bracelet. The bracelet was made in France in the Victorian era, Circa 1875. It was crafted from 18 carats yellow gold, and in the center of the piece, we can see an old Min diamond with a star motif around it. Additionally, there are pieces of rose cut diamonds in repeated circles around the center. Usually, due to age, a turquoise piece like this would have had some discoloration, but this bracelet is still in pristine condition. Vibrant, that robin egg blue that you look for, it's all there, none of it is discolored. At auction, this bracelet that exemplifies Persian craftsmanship would sell for. In a range of $6,000 to $8,000. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's That's amazing. This guest's husband studied at Washington State University and was a student of Clifford Still. Clifford Still was an American painter and the leading figure in the first generation of abstract expressionism. Yes. Now, around about 1938 to 1942, he started to make that transition from figurative representational work to more abstract art. When the guest's husband received his doctorate, the chairman of his department gifted him with this painting as a housewarming present. Clifford Still painted this piece in 1937, and it is signed and dated in the lower right corner. The painting depicts Cooley, Washington, during the construction of the dam. It features large swaths of color that seem to mimic geological formations. Additionally, the painting portrays the Grand Cooley's massive chiseled landscape carved by ancient floodwaters. The condition of this painting is remarkable, with no damage incurred. Artworks by Clifford Still are highly sought after by collectors, in this excellent condition, the piece would be worth. I believe that this shouldn't be insured for anything less than half a million dollars. Put our insurance... I have to say, in all my years on the roadshow, it's probably the most exciting find I've had. Oh, really? And I'm absolutely thrilled that you brought it in today. Well, thank so you. So thank you. Carved into this wooden staff is a menagerie of 182 centuries, each telling a story of nature's diversity and one man's extraordinary vision. It says on the top, there are 182 figures Correct. carved into the cane. Wow. This cane, crafted by the enigmatic J.D. Batts in 1881, is a testament to the artistry of a sheep herder turned master carver. From fishes to reptiles, mammals to insects, this cane is a miniature arc of the animal kingdom. Here we see a beautiful hammerhead shark. Yep. We go down here and we're visiting the animal kingdom. We go further down. Bats's attention to detail is astounding, with each figure meticulously carved and labeled on this wooden canvas. The cane's history is as rich as its artistry, winning prizes at California agricultural fairs in the late 19th century. Despite the yellowing varnish that slightly diminishes its polychrome beauty, the cane's value remains significant. This piece represents a rare body of work from an artist previously unknown in the world of cane collecting, from its bone handle to its once protected tip, every inch of this cane tells a story of craftsmanship and imagination. This extraordinary piece of American folk art is valued at would be in the four to $5,000 range. Oh, wow. Great. In the realm of haute couture, where fabric becomes art and labels whisper luxury, lies a garment that transcends mere fashion. This isn't just Chanel, it's a Chanel couture a masterpiece of design that represents the pinnacle of sartorial craftsmanship. Artistry. It is more vibrant than you normally see for Chanel. It is exciting to see it because it really is Chanel. The label is exactly right. Custom designed and meticulously crafted, this coat embodies the essence of Coco Chanel's visionary style. Coco Chanel. Every stitch, every detail speaks to the unparalleled quality that defines Chanel couture. This garment isn't just clothing, it's a wearable piece of fashion history. Its value lies not just in its brand, but in the artistic and exclusivity it represents. For collectors and fashion enthusiasts, this coat is a holy grail of vintage couture. This exquisite piece of Chanel couture is valued at. Your auction or a major dealer to buy a piece like this, you would expect to pay somewhere between $25,000 and $30,000 for this coat. Wow. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yes, it is. A rare first edition of Gone with the Wind, signed by Margaret Mitchell, is the item in question. This copy, purchased in May 1936, features Mitchell's signature, a rarity as she disliked signing books. Despite somewhere, including a missing piece on the dust jacket and soiling on the pages, 
it remains in excellent condition. Acquired from a bookstore in South Florida, the book was gifted to the guest by her husband. Margaret Mitchell wrote Gone with the Wind while recovering from an auto accident in 1935, submitted to Macmillan. The manuscript impressed the editor, prompting Mitchell to spend years revising it. This true first edition, with its rare signature, is precious. A book that was actually published after the first edition of the book, not simultaneously with it. Oh, and right. if you would uh, open it up to the marked page. Although not in mint condition, the book's auction estimate is between. At retail, at between twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. Tiffany lamp purchased at auction in Manassas, Virginia, outside of Washington D.C many years ago was brought in. This lamp features a shade with an intricate design, indicative of its early origin in the late 1890s, when such lamps were initially designed for fuel rather than electricity. I'm going to take the shade off the base. I'm wearing my glasses especially so that nothing <laughs> happens. Notably, the shade bears a genuine Tiffany signature, indicating its authenticity. However, it underwent modifications over time, including an attempted conversion to electric lighting. Originally finished in brown, the lamp has been stripped down to its brass base, impacting its overall value. Despite these alterations, the authentic Tiffany components, including the shade and base signatures, authenticate its origin. In its current condition, at auction, this Tiffany lamp would fetch around. In today's market, the lamp as it is in a retail store would sell for around $5,000. Oh, good. Most of the value is in this shade. In the mid to late 1950s, the guest's father acquired two Rembrandt etchings at La Sienga's Boulevard Art Walk. Christ at Emmaus, dating back to 1634, bears Rembrandt's signature and an ink stamp from a late 19th century collector. This early print is noted for its fine impression and intact lines, classified as the first state of three, making it highly desirable. The second etching, a self-portrait of Rembrandt, was created in 1630, when the artist was 24 years old. This print showcases Rembrandt's distinctive style, capturing emotion and mood with theatrical flair. A self-portrait he made in 1630, he was born in 1606. So he was 24 years old when he made the self-portrait. It's showing him sort of astonished. It's theatrical. Despite age-related spotting and damage, its rarity and historical significance greatly enhance its value. It underscores the enduring appeal and investment potential of Rembrandt's work in the art market. A combined value of both Rembrandt etchings is estimated to range between. At auction, in this condition, I would estimate it at forty to sixty thousand dollars. No way. This beautiful box is not only a rare and exquisite example of craftsmanship from the late 19th century, but it also carries a rich family history. The piece originally belonged to the guest's great-grandparents, who were married in Buffalo, New York, in 1874. They purchased it sometime after their marriage, and it has remained in the family since. It was relocated to California around 1940 by the guest's parents, and has been there ever since. The appraiser notes that the piece is a bedroom safe, dating back to around 1880 and likely manufactured in upstate New York. The safe features a cast iron foundation with a polychrome application, including a beautifully floral decorated panel that reflects the aesthetic movement popular in America during the 1880s. Inside, the safe has a high quality rosewood lining and bird's eye maple drawers, indicating its New York origin. The appraiser highlights the intricate details, such as a change drawer lined in mahogany, a gentleman's drawer, a velvet lined jewelry casket, and a large drawer likely used for documents. Just a larger drawer for probably documents, documents and, and similar, things. similar material. The piece retains its original surface and decoration, which is uncommon and adds to its appeal. The unique design and well-preserved condition contribute to its value. An auction estimate on a piece like this? <laughs> Fifteen to twenty-five hundred dollars. Oh, wow! Good. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Right. That's wonderful. Bye. In the folds of denim, a discarded garment transforms into a treasured piece of fashion history. This adult-sized Levi Strauss romper, once destined for the trash, now stands as a unique piece of denim history. Levi Strauss. Strauss was a German-born American businessman who founded the first company to manufacture blue jeans. Styled like a woman's garment, but sized for an adult, 
This rare piece blurs the lines between children's and adult fashion. Full of antics, and she'd be thrilled today to be here with these. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Well, they are made by Levi Strauss. The iconic Levi Strauss label and distinctive features like the drop seat buttons hint at its playful origins. It says Levi Strauss and Company, San Francisco, California. There would have been a lot number here and an age if we were looking at the ones that were actually made for children. Blue denim accented with red trim showcases the classic Levi's aesthetic, now beautifully faded with time. Rescued from obscurity, this romper bridges generations of style and sentiment. Its excellent condition and rarity make it a coveted piece for denim enthusiasts and fashion historians alike. This one-of-a-kind Levi's garment is now valued at. I would put a retail value on this between $4,500 and $5,500. That is terrific. <laughs> Unfolding before us is a map that not only shows land, but also the progress of a region over time. This century-old roller map of Long Island is more than paper and ink. It's a testament to history and development. Published by Colton in 1844, this second edition map reveals the evolution of one of America's oldest railroads. Another method for dating it is the progress of the Long Island Railroad. Mm -hmm. The surveyor who published it was John Calvin Smith, an American surveyor and geographer active in New York in the mid-19th century. From indigenous names to Dutch settlements, it paints a vivid picture of Long Island's diverse cultural tapestry. So it's what's known as a terminal moraine, the north shore of Long Island, or the Gold Coast, as you would call it. The map's details are exquisite. Elevations, swamps, marshes, trees and culture intertwined. Five insets showcase commercial connections, including a fascinating glimpse of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It also has five insets here, which show the commercial connections between Long Island. This family heirloom, once a functional office tool, survived a house fire in the 1960s with its original watercolor intact. This rare cartographic gem is valued at. In a retail setting, I would estimate this to sell for between $5,000 and $6,000. Wow. This intriguing piece had been in the guest's family for many years, originally gifted to the guest's parents. But he also wrote the screenplay for Broadway Melody, the second Academy Award, and played polo with uh, Will Rogers, partied with the Hearsts. By James Gleason. James Gleason was an American actor, playwright, and screenwriter. This pair of items was crafted circa 1930, during the Art Deco era in Paris. They are porcelain flasks made by... They were made right in the heart of the Art Deco era in Paris. By George's Bastard. Bastard was a French visual artist specializing in working with Horn, mother of pearl. And it's kind of an umbrella term to describe all of the decorative arts that were shown in Paris. And other materials to create objects such as checkerboards and chessboards. These flasks were designed to hold liquids such as liquor. They are shaped like a tennis player and boxer, respectively. Any work by George's Bastard is very rare and highly desirable which allows us to anticipate the flask shaped like a tennis player to be worth. And I believe if he came up in a good auction, you would expect an estimate of at least $700 and perhaps $900. All right. While the flask shaped like a boxer would be valued at. The boxer, I think, somewhere between $400 and $600. All right. This set of jewelry was inherited from the guest's great aunt, her husband was a congressman, they had no children, and he spoiled her with jewels. He certainly did. These are Art Deco pieces, made from diamond and ruby. The pendant of the necklace features two pear-shaped diamonds, a larger one of two and a half carats, and a smaller one of one and a half carats. The ring, on the other hand, has roughly three carats of diamond, and two and a half carats of rubies set into platinum. The ruby is a natural Burmese ruby, from Burma, neither treated nor color enhanced. And the ring was made roughly around 1925. There's no maker's mark in the ring, but it's a very good jeweler, probably in New York City. Bearing no mark of its maker, one can only appreciate the great craftsmanship and detail of the ring. Finally, the bracelet has a large ruby center stone weighing three and a half carats, along with 31 other rubies set to weigh a total of 27 carats. These rubies also are Burma quality. 
the small ones are a little better than the center one. It also has 70 baguette cut diamonds and 144 round diamonds, approximately 15 carats of diamonds in total. This jewelry set is simply magnificent. Its collective value in today's market is estimated at. The three pieces together in today's market is worth somewhere about $257,000 in that area. Wow. This piece was a great find for the guest who purchased it at an estate sale in Virginia. Well, I didn't get breakfast myself. It was out <laughs> early this morning. Well, I'm so. glad you came in with this wonderful tea caddy. A collector of boxes and tea caddies, this very unusual piece struck the guest. It is a pear-shaped tea caddy made of wood, pivotal to European life in the 18th century. This artifact was literally as important as gold. Well, there were several antique dealers at the same estate sale where uh -huh. I was at the sale, and um, they didn't seem to be very interested in it, and that made me feel... The origin of the piece is shrouded in doubt, as it has seen some questionable restoration over the years. One of the replacements is the B logo, which is not original. The darker background shows the original stain of the caddy. Near the ivory escutcheon, there is some shrinkage, and the hinge at the back shows some signs of wear, indicating the artifact is quite old. The appraiser is certain the piece is an original, although the stem and the foil on the inside have been replaced, showcasing great craftsmanship and ingenuity. This piece is estimated to be worth. It's about 4,000. You actually oh. got it right. It's a wonderful Sweet. example of okay. a tea caddy, and uh, hope you enjoy it. It's a terrific one. Upon building their first house, this piece was a housewarming gift given to the guest's family. When we built our first house, and I was five years old, grandfather was an overseer in a prison. The guest's grandfather, who was an overseer of the Weathersfield, Connecticut prison, bought this prison art train model for $17. Weathersfield, Connecticut prison. Prison arts are usually highly sophisticated pieces made from assembled small pieces of wood. This is a fully developed train model and a highly sophisticated piece at that, showcasing amazing craftsmanship and brilliance. The maker was a true genius. The piece took two years to make as the maker was in the shoe department of the prison. And it rotates. Yeah. That shows a real degree of sophistication yeah. as far as the maker is concerned. The work is tight, it's beautifully carved. Another unique feature of this train model is the gearbox, which controls the movement of the train. I guess this has probably took them a year to make. Two years. Two years to Two make. Two years. All good. Wonderful yeah. piece of folk art. What I love most about it is this gearbox down here. The work is tight and beautifully carved. To a collector of folk arts, this piece is estimated to be worth. In a retail environment, this would probably sell in the area of $4,500 to six thousand dollars. Wow, <laughs> I'm so glad to know that. This guest bought the guitar from a kid in the 1960s for about eighty-five dollars. So you've had it since then. Yes. You bought it about 1960. Yeah, about sixty-five probably. I think we paid about eighty-five dollars. Okay. For it. Yeah. Okay. Presented is a 1960 model of the Gibson Les Paul solid body electric guitar produced and distributed by the Gibson Guitar Company in 1954, Gibson Guitar Corporation. Gibson Guitar Corporation is an American manufacturer of guitars founded in 1894 by Orville Gibson. Orville Gibson. This model was named after its pioneer and founder, Lester William Pulsefuss, whose prototype, the log, was the source of its inspiration. Lester William Pulsefuss. This piece has been preserved meticulously over the years and is in perfect condition. Then I thought, well, it's a Les Paul Jr. and on Antiques Roadshows, I've seen that they're not for free, you know. Typically, the body and neck are made from mahogany, while the fretboard is made from rosewood. It still retains its original finish, showcasing its excellent preservation. A pretty good investment of $85. This guitar now has an auction price of. But I can conservatively say in a retail environment, this guitar is worth about $5,500 to $6,000. Oh. World War II memorabilia can hold immense historical value, and this bomber jacket is no exception. A guest brought in a World War II bomber jacket they found in a house purchased from a veteran of the 390th Bomb Group. The veteran sustained injuries from shrapnel and flak while on a bombing mission over Germany. The appraiser identified it as a World War II Army Air Corps A2 flight jacket. So what you have here is a World War II Army Air Corps A2 flight jacket. 
made from horsehide by Cable Raincoat Company. The jacket featured in the 390th Bomb Group patch on the front, Prowlin' Tom adorned the back with a painted cat and 26 bombing mission markers. The condition showed damage from being stored on a hangar, but the paint remained in excellent condition. The paint's condition significantly contributed to its value. The appraiser estimated its auction value as and we figured that the auction value for this would be between $6,000 and $9,000. No! Yeah, wow. it's a really nice jacket. Wow. Who knew a simple office chair could hold so much history? The guests shared that their grandfather, a city commissioner and former acting mayor, acquired an old chair during a remodeling of public offices. The chair, depicted in a photograph with the guest's grandfather seated in it, was given to him with permission when he left office. This chair holds particular interest because it is the Omaha City Mayor's Chair, a fact well documented with several photographs, including one published in the July 1947 issue of Life magazine. The appraiser found the chair especially fascinating, as it is a Renaissance Revival carved oak office chair. The greatest thing that's ever wow. shown up. I mean, it is so elaborate. This is really a happening chair. It completes with lion head griffins as arm supports and intricate carvings on the sides and back, showcasing the full expression of the Renaissance Revival style. The chair likely dates back to around 1880 and is thought to have been made in the Great Lakes region, possibly between Chicago, Pittsburgh or Buffalo, a significant center for furniture manufactured in that era. The chair remains in remarkable condition despite being reupholstered. And I suspect it was made between Chicago and Pittsburgh or Buffalo. That Great Lakes region was a big manufacturing hub. Which is akin to changing the tires on a car and does not detract from its value. While giving an estimate, the appraiser said. In today's auction estimates, we're looking at something that's $3,000 to $5,000. Wow. This piece is a family heirloom passed down from the guest's grandmother. But I don't know where she got it from. Her family was Danish. Presented is a necklace with a Renaissance Revival pendant. The pendant features various design elements inspired by Renaissance paintings. It's a very interesting piece. It's also a very large piece. Stylistically, we refer to this as Renaissance Revival. Although there are no hallmarks, this piece is of Austro-Hungarian origin and was made in the mid-19th century. The pendant is crafted from a combination of silver and gold pieces. The centerpiece is a carved cameo, intricately detailed, showcasing the exceptional talent of the carver. Concerned. This is actually a very nice example. You've got a combination of silver and gold, but the real star is its centerpiece. This is a carved cameo. The cameo depicts Hercules wrestling the lion and dates slightly later than the pendant, approximately from the late 17th century to early 18th century, and is of Italian origin. Bearing multiple unique features, this pendant is a rare and valuable piece with an estimated value of. And I would say a piece like this at auction could bring anywhere between ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I had no idea. Paintings often hold hidden histories and values, and this small inherited piece proved to be no exception. The guest brought a small painting inherited from a friend to the roadshow. They've had it for about seven or eight years but knew little about its origins. The appraiser identified it as a Trompelil still life by a renowned 19th century painter, Robert Spear Dunning from Fall River, Massachusetts. Dunning, born in 1829 in Maine, was known for his still life paintings that captured the opulence of Queen Victoria's era. The painting showed some craquelure and surface dust, but was in fair condition overall. Fall River was a very wealthy mill town. Still life painting was very popular there because it the painting's luscious depiction of peaches and its historical significance added to its appeal. The appraiser estimated its auction value in its current state as. If we were estimating this painting for auction today, in the current condition, the auction estimate would be $5,000 to $10,000. Wonderful. With a professional cleaning, the estimate could rise too. That would change the estimate to probably eight to 12000 because the painting would really pop. The guest brought in a set of plates and bowls to the show. I would say 30 years ago by an English antique dealer. They were given to his mother as a gift by an English antique dealer about 30 years ago. The pieces were Kutani style, characterized by hand painting enameling and an Asian aesthetic, reflected by the Japonesque movement, popularized after exhibitions in Paris and London, 
around 1868 to 1869. The mark on the bottom of the pieces indicates both the town and type of ware. They were made by Jules Villiard in Bordeaux, and the low-fired pale earthenware was known as Bordeaux Faience. The collection was praised for its quality and craftsmanship. Given the historical significance and desirability, the suggested value was. We are thinking that auction type prices, the plates would probably be about $500 a piece. Right. And the bowls probably $750 to $1,000 a piece. Right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Francis Hodgson Burnett's item, inherited from the guest's dad, part of a 97-piece set. It was crafted by Salviati, an Italian-Venetian firm, in the late 19th century. Salviati, a renowned Venetian glassmaker, crafted intricate Murano glassware. They feature intricate patterns and vibrant colors, showcasing Salviati glassmaker's skilled artistry, adorned with griffins and her initials. This is part of a 97-piece set that has been passed down. My dad was orphaned in 1918 in the flu epidemic. Crafted from exquisite glass, these pieces showcase timeless techniques and allure. Each item showcases intricate enamel work. Marveling at the intricate enamel detailing and vibrant motifs, the appraiser valued the item. I would put an auction estimate on this of ten to fifteen thousand oh, dollars. Right. <laughs> well, that is more than I would have said. Yes. <laughs> The guest's father received a pair of dolls as a Christmas gift in 1938, when he was nine years old. These items were iconic characters from the popular show, Lone Ranger. The remarkable dolls depict the characters, Lone Ranger and Tonto. What's intriguing is, these dolls came with so many accessories. They were notable for their completeness, featuring many accessories. The appraiser noted that the Lone Ranger doll included a hat with a paper hat band marked Lone Ranger. You even have remnants of an original box with the original price of $3.50. It also included a string tag, cap guns and a badge. Press sawdust and glue. So it's, they're in a remarkable state of preservation. Moreover, the Toronto doll included a rubber knife. The guest also brought the original box with a price tag of $3.50. These dolls were exceptionally rare and exhibited a well-preserved condition. Given their desirability, the estimate value for the pair was. I'd say the pair to, on today's market would easily bring $2,000. Wow. Guest presented two Chinese porcelain jars that belonged to her father. However, she was unaware of their origin or how his father acquired them. The appraiser revealed that the pieces were 300 years old. They dated back to the reign of Kangxi, an early Qing dynasty emperor. The jars featured a deep blue and prunus blossom design throughout. The first jar had a Kangxi mark on the bottom, indicating it was made during that period. Additionally, the piece had its original cover, which enhanced the value. The other jar lacked original cover and the Kangxi mark. Now this one has some uh, reserves, shaped reserves of antiquities, as it's known. Whereas this one is prunus blossom on a blue ground all around. Both jars were praised for their aesthetic appeal and great condition, despite being 300 years old. Given their rarity and quality of craftsmanship, the potential value was estimated to be. Without the cover, without a mark, I would say $1,500 to $2,000, something like really? that. This one, with the cover and with the mark, three to 5000 maybe more. Oh they're both goodness. very, very nice jars and they're in great condition. The guest acquired a book from a flea market in upstate New York for $2. I couldn't find much information. I think it's in German, that could be why. It's just pictures, and they all seem to feature the same guy. The book featured illustrations of the same figure throughout. It was identified as the 1928 first edition of Das Werk by Franz Maisriel. The appraiser provided details about the artist, known for pioneering wordless novels using woodcuts. They're a series of woodcuts that tell stories without any words. Really? The pictures are wonderful, and mm -hmm. I think we should take a look at them. Mace Reel's works are considered masterpieces of the genre, depicting narratives solely through visual storytelling without words. The book's illustration were individually carved woodcuts, each effectively telling a story. Mace Reel's artistic career emerged during the Art Deco movement, where he portrayed themes of human struggle, the appraiser praised Mace Reel's productivity and artistic longevity. 
Given the condition and desirability among book enthusiasts, the suggested retail value was. Retail would be $1,000 to $1,500. Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> The guest brought an ice pick acquired by her in-laws at an estate sale for $45. It was identified as a Gorham Sterling Silver Polar Bear ice pick. The appraiser mentioned that the piece was part of a series produced by Gorham in the late 19th century. Dating back to Circa 1870, the exceptionally rare piece featured intricate detailing. The item bore the retailer's mark of Crosby, Morse, and Foss from Boston, pinpointing its production timeline to the early 1870s. This period coincided with heightened instinct in polar themes following the U.S. acquisition of Alaska in 1867. The appraiser praised the item for its historical significance and scarcity in the market. Given its appeal among collectors of antique silver, the suggested value was... With our rarity today, retail value... Mm-hmm. $4,500. Oh my gosh, 